the myths and mandrakes, Anthony Carter unravels the origins of the enigmatic mandrake myth, which despite seeping into modern culture, retains the same aura of mystery the plant has enjoyed for centuries. While his approach, I argue, outlines the origin of the myth superbly well, uh, as well as key periods of, in history was documented to change or evolve, his reliance merely on extant physical evidence prevents his account from being fully explanatory. In this project, I'll attempt to strengthen his core argument by introducing a theory from evolutionary biology to describe how the mandrake story changed and evolved outside the mediums where the change was recorded. Mandrakes are, of course, a topic worthy of exploration, permeating the stories and cultural artifacts of Western Europe. Yet this ubiquity makes dissecting exactly where and how the myth spread a complicated process. In his paper, Carter writes how the mandrake myth first arose in, it, in its most general form in the book of Genesis. And this motif with fertility enhancement later became coupled with the medieval doctrine of signatures, which held that God endowed plants with signs that represent their properties. The public reinforce this association between the mandrake's anthropomorphism and its fertility-enhancing properties by superstitiously buying and sleeping with these plants. And as the myths around the mandrake spread, it became associated with good luck, charm, and even controlled people's destinies, causing the church to pivot and paint the plant in a negative light. In 1431, Carter claims, they even use an acquisition, accusation of possessing a mandrake as evidence that Joan of Arc should be burnt at the stake. Separately, Carter uses a description of the mandrake as a surgical anesthetic by the Greek physician Dioscorides in 60 AD as evidence that its botanical properties, in particular its ability to cause hallucination, delirium, and comas, were known since antiquity. This toxicity, he posits, causes association with magic, witchcraft, and the supernatural. These medical properties, furthermore, cause the root to be highly sought after in the Mediterranean. Growers attempting to protect the mandrake crops from theft were thought to create and spread a myth around the plant that a demon inhabiting the root would kill anyone attempting to harvest it. This mandrake's curse, as it became known, took a variety of forms, and as the demon's shriek became perceived as the cause of the curse, precautionary superstitions like blowing a horn when the mandrake is uprooted grew in popularity. Then, in the 11th century, the mandrake myth spread to Britain. Without the growing conditions uh, and the northern climate necessary to support mandrake cultivation, the myth associated with similar endemic plants such as henbane, or white bryony, which shared either its distinctive human-like form or comparable pharmacological profile. Prominent Englishmen such as Dr. William Turner or Geoffrey Chaucer incorporated aspects of the superstition into the work, and as the myth became embedded in art and literature, its forms exhibited greater diversity than we see today. Shakespeare, for instance, alluded to it in several of his plays, portraying it as a charm curse or sedative. Machiavelli similarly blundered its status as a fertility enhancer and curse in his book The Mandrake Root. Carter then describes how a new myth that mandrakes grow from ground soiled with blood or semen began to circulate, yet offers no explanation of where this came from. He does, however, provide evidence that this new myth spread rapidly on its own, being incorporated into plays and later into movies. And as it spread, new associations with mistletoe, gallows, and graveyards added to and further propagated the myth. With this account, Char Carter provides a compelling story predicated in evidentiary documentation spanning millennium that traced the myth back to its earliest form in its biblical beginnings and follows its evolution to its present day ubiquity. While it's certainly a compelling argument, I believe in its present form, his paper is particularly vulnerable to criticism on the grounds that the central propagation method cited for the Mandrake's myths spread is alluded to but never explored in depth. To strengthen his account, I propose introducing a theory devised and developed in the field of evolutionary biology, meme theory, as an overarching explanation, explanatory mechanism for the spread of the Mandrake myth. Physical documentation of the Mandrake story would serve as evidence of this other underlying mechanism, rather than being an explanatory account in its own right. This should open new avenues for exploring the myth's spread and evolution. In his groundbreaking work, The Selfish Gene, renowned evolutionary bi biologist Richard Dawkins coins the term meme to convey the idea of a unit of cultural transmission or a unit of imitation. One may consider them akin to viruses, as a fertile meme may turn one's brain to a vehicle for a myth's propagation in the same way that a virus can parasitize a genetic mechanism of a host cell. As the meme spreads between individuals, it's subject to continuous mutation and blending, which either reinforce or detract from its replicability. In The Beginning of Infinity, a book that explores the limit of science and information theory, David Deutsch explores how this affects populations of ideas, stating that the central assertion of Dawkins' theory is a population of replicators subject to variation will be taken over by those variants that are better than their rivals at causing themselves to be replicated. The Mandrake myth, I propose, fits neatly within the established definition of a, of a meme, 
being a mutable unit of cultural transmission. Notably, this meme of the mandrake myth is naturally closely intertwined with the plan itself. This relationship, along with the mimetic concept of fitness to, to survive, now explains why, of countless supernatural properties attributed to the plant initially, particular associations survived. When the plant became popular as a fertility enhancer, the meme of the mandrake spread, spread throughout the population, mutating into countless forms, such as a good luck charm, wealth augmenter, popularity enhancer, or destiny controlling object. These memes were more, the memes more likely to survive and reproduce were the ones which were backed by the properties of the plant itself. So it was the process of cultural transmission itself, not necessarily the influence of the church, that began to associate the mandrake with witchcraft and wickedness, as it was mirrored by the plant's toxic properties. With the lens of mimetic understanding, we can now more fully explain how and why the myth evolved as it did between the 1st century Greece and 11th century Britain. The mandrake meme was subject to both international intentional shaping and non-intentional reinforcement in ways that enhanced its fitness to survive and reproduce. Growers seeking to protect their mandrake crop would propagate a, me a meme about it being inhabited by a demon, since those who consume the plant would indeed be subject to harmful effects. Credence would be granted to the meme, reinforcing and spreading it further. This active and reinforced transmission could potentially account for why the myth became popularized um, enough to cross continental Europe and reach Britain. In Britain, unconstrained by growing conditions, the mandrake meme then began to spread faster than its physical counterpart could, could undertaking what I call decoupling. In this decoupled environment where the meme was physically reinforced by botanically wasn't re physically reinforced by botanically similar plants, the mandrake myth, I propose, again exhibited a greater diversity of forms. Supplemented by the intentional mutation of this meme in literature and plays for artistic purposes, the mandrake now began associated with sedation and charm. Carter's evidence of various properties ascribed to the mandrake across Shakespeare's plays lends credence to this possible explanation. Additionally, the mandrake meme became commonplace across Europe. It was transmitted more frequently, and just as the analogous virus would, it became relatively more prone to mutation. With this newfound framing, it's understandable how a meme mutated uh, again and became associated with bodily fluid contamination, gallows, or graveyard. Of course, these explanations are speculative. The evidence to substantiate their claims simply does not exist. But reframing mimetic transmission as the primary agent of changes in the mandrake meme's form provide a powerful and explanatory bridge across century-long gaps between Carter's different pieces uh, of introduced evidence showing the mandrake's evolving associations. Ultimately, by applying meme theory to his paper, Carter would be able to open new avenues for historical examination, using meta-analyses of interpersonal spread and mutation of the mandrake myth itself to illuminate how historical evidence and documents fit together cohesively.